Uh, we start a brand new sermon series today, um, which one I'm, I'm very excited about. And uh, because we plan everything a year out, uh, this was already planned um, September of, of last year. And, um, and I've been excited since then. Can you imagine? I've been containing it, um, but now I get to let it all out. Um, Philemon is a, is a very interesting uh, book in the New Testament. Um, if you have your Bible, I'd encourage you to go there. Uh, we're going to do a lot of scribbling over these next few weeks in the book of Philemon. And so uh, if you have a physical Bible, uh, this would be a great time to actually bring it with. Uh, we're going to be in this book for the next three weeks. We might do four weeks. I'm not 100% sure. We'll see uh, where God uh, leads us. But we have it planned uh, for the next three weeks. Uh, it's the shortest letter uh, of all of Paul's letters. And so Paul the Apostle wrote it. Uh, it's very, 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 very short. You could read it literally uh, in a matter of minutes. Uh, it's 25 verses. We'll read it through as, as well. Uh, it's, these three weeks are going to kind of give you an idea of, of my sermon prep uh, procedures, if you will. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to comb through this book over these next three weeks over and over and over again. Um, you will not get sick of it. It's absolutely incredible. There's so much in here. Um, but this week is going to feel a lot more kind of doctrine or, or theological. Um, and then as the weeks go on, it'll feel more and more and more practical. This is what I do every time I come to a text. And I couldn't think of a better way to do this. But it's short enough that we can do it. Um, but it's also really, really cool because it gives you kind of insights to how uh, all these sermons come to be. And, and so Philemon is where we're going to be. I'm going to read it. Uh, I'm going to pray and then we're going to jump straight in. Um, hey, hey? Philemon. That's how I pronounce it. How do you guys, is it Philemon? Philemon. Yeah, how do you guys, how do you guys pronounce it? Philemon. That's, there's a lot of changes I'm going to have to do in my sermon. If that's the, no, listen. No, listen, listen, listen. Depending on where you went to school, it'll determine... <laughs> It'll determine how you pronounce it, all right? I pronounce it Philemon. Some of you may pronounce it Philemon. Um, trust me, when it gets to God's ears, it's all great, you know? So, so Philemon. <laughs> Hear these words of our Father. <laughs> Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God when I mention you in my prayers, because I hear of your love for all the saints and the faith that you have in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your participation in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. For this reason, although I have great boldness in Christ to command you to do what is right, I appeal to you instead on the basis of love. I, Paul, as an elderly man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, appeal to you for my son Onesimus. I became his father while I was in chains. Once he was useless to you, but now he is useful both to you and me. I'm sending him back to you. I'm sending my very own heart. I wanted to keep him with me so that in my imprisonment for the gospel, he might serve me in your place. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that your good deed might not be without obligation, but of your own free will. For perhaps this is why he was separated from you for a brief time so that you might get him back permanently. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a dearly loved brother. He is especially so to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would me. And if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention to you that you owe me even your very self. Yes, brother, may I benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Since I am confident of your obedience, I'm writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, since I hope that through your prayers I will be restored to you. 
Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, and so do Mark and Aretakis and Demas and Luke, my co-workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. These words are old. They're ancient, but they're not dead. They're very much alive. And so, God, would you cause our hearts to be tender so that we might receive them well? I ask that you think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you'd have us know, say, and do. May the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our king. You are our redeemer. Would you have your way in this place? In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Okay, we don't have a lot of time, so you guys need to listen quick. They are, they are four theological themes that are present in this book, all right? Four theological, and look, look, I know, I know, there's way more than four. I know that. But, but as I was looking at this book and as I've studied this book, I, I've come with four theological themes that I would be able to kind of use as big stones that we put in a jar that are going to help us navigate through this book. And those four theological themes are this, redemption, reconciliation, fellowship, and societal transformation. Let me say that again. Redemption, reconciliation, fellowship, and societal transformation. Now, now, let me flesh these out a little bit so that we have some working definitions as we make our way through this book. And look, my hope is this, is, is that as we read and as we dive deeper and as we unpack, that you're able to go, mm, I see where that hangs. That hangs over redemption and that hangs over fellowship and so on and so on. But let me give you some working definitions. Redemption, see, when we hear redemption, when we think about redemption, we should know that this refers to the work of Christ on our behalf, whereby he purchases us, where he ransoms us at the price of his own life, securing our deliverance from the bondage and condemnation of sin. Now, I know that redemption is a word that we don't use in our everyday conversations, but when we think redemption, we should think the purchasing of a slave. You see, redemption brings about an identity change. And from this new identity, it's a new way of thinking and a new way of doing things. The other thing that you should know is that redemption is costly. Redemption is costly. Okay, so that's redemption. Let's talk reconciliation. Reconciliation, and, and here I'm talking about biblical reconciliation, is the process of two previously alienated parties coming to peace with each other. Because God has reconciled us to himself through Jesus, we reconcile with one another. That is the implication of our reconciliation with God the Father, is that we are now reconciled to one another no longer counting offenses against one another. It's important to know that, that reconciliation flows from repentance and forgiveness. That's massively important. Reconciliation flows from repentance and forgiveness. So oh no, what are you saying? If there's no repentance, can we have reconciliation? No. See, re repentance is the acknowledging of one's wrong. It's recognizing, let's talk about the gospel, it's recognizing that I am in desperate need of a savior, that I have been rebellious to our father. And so I repent and then God forgives and through that there is this reconciliation that happens. You should also know that reconciliation has an Irish twin. And that Irish twin is long-suffering. Or maybe a word we prefer today, patience. But we'll get to that next week. That's reconciliation. Fellowship, when we talk about fellowship, we, we have to think way deeper than what we understand as fellowship today. And I know that the, the way that we understand it, even though it's in our name, the way that we understand it is, isn't as, as deep as we see it in the scriptures because of the way that we practice our fellowship. You see, those who believe the gospel those who trust Jesus for salvation, we are united in the spirit. 
We are united in the Spirit through Christ to the Father. And that unity, that unity is the the very basis of our fellowship. And so if we recognize the power of that unity, then I'm telling you the way we fellowship would be radically different. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 to 6 says this, For there is one body and one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. That's the very basis of our fellowship. It's recognizing that, wow, like, that what brings us together is this, is this unity that comes through the gospel. I know in here, we all have blood family. But you also need to realize that you have blood-bought family. See, biblical fellowship is blood-bought. It's not that we share the same last names. It's not because we come from the same place. It's not because we look the same. No, 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 no. It's because of what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. And this, friends, has massive implications. And so the, the third theological theme here is, is fellowship. And then the last one is societal transformation. Societal transformation. Now, now, while this one may not be obvious as we read through the text, it, it's very clear that it's happening. Very, very clear that it's happening. See, this is when the people of God are doing the things of God and sharing the message of God. And as the Spirit of God works in them, all of God and His kingdom spills over into the places where we live, work, and play. See, the gospel has social implications. Now, there's a lot of people that don't like to hear that, and so they come up with all these other things to go, oh, you must be this, and you must be this. No, 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 no. The gospel has social implications. The, The announcement of the liberating and transforming love of God in Christ fundamentally is about divine healing that restores the possibility of communion. God with humanity and then humanity with all of creation. Societal transformation. Dr. Batanai Manika, who I'm gonna quote quite a bit throughout this sermon series, um, a very, very dear friend to me, and, and, and many of you uh, know him. He uh, had been here many times uh, at Rooted Fellowship, preached here many times, but uh, earlier this year went to be with the Lord. Um, and, and so even when we were preparing this last year in light of this, uh, just sitting with him, and, and whether it's over Zoom or in person, and just wrestling with all of this, I mean, he, he was a PhD in the book of Philemon. This brother knew Philemon. He knew it all, right? He knew it all. And and, and so I'm going to quote him quite a bit. And here's what he says. As we think about societal transformation, here's what he says in his uh, thesis. He says, in one stroke of the pen, Paul recovers the slave's dignity and worth by calling him a beloved brother. It is important to note that in this letter, Onesimus is elevated to a place where he and and Philemon stand on equal ground as brothers. While Philemon's journey in this realization may have been short, for Onesimus, this was a voyage of great ontological transformation by the gospel. You see, Dr. Batanamanyika, who I'm going to refer to as Dr. Bat, would often talk about and affirm this kind of transformation having an impact on our society. Not only does it transform us, but it has a massive impact on our society. It it shifts society in some way. Another way to say it is, friends, people are watching. They're watching you, they're watching us, and it has an impact. We hope for the positive but, 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 but it's sad to say in our day, I feel like it's for the negative, but they are watching. So we should listen for these themes, redemption, reconciliation, fellowship, and societal transformation. Now, just in case you don't really know this, this book, uh, I'm going to today, in most of the sermon today is just really giving you a, an overview, a high level overview. I'm still going to preach, but a high level overview of this book. You, uh, I've, I've said it a few times. I've, I've read it to you. Uh, let me just go ahead and tell you again. The main characters of this book is, is Philemon, or Philemon uh, the individual to whom this letter is addressed. Philemon, I'm going to love doing this, going back and forth between the, this is great. Part of being transcultural. There we go. 
<laughs> Philemon hosted a church in his, in his home. Um, so there's him, and then there's, then there's the Apostle Paul, right? He's, he's the author of this letter, and, and he puts this letter together while he's in prison. Okay, so it's important for us to know that. And, and then there's the third character, which is Onesimus, who is a runaway slave. Now, some of you are already getting uncomfortable. Just hold on for a moment. We'll get to that. We know that Philemon was written about the same time as Colossians was written. Uh, we know this because the, 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 if you look at both books, there's, uh, the, there's similar names that come up, similar individuals that, that come up. It was written probably in AD 60, 61. And remember I told you that Paul wrote this from prison. He's sitting in, in a prison cell as he writes this letter to this individual. This is a very personal letter. Unlike the other letters that Paul writes, he, he, he writes to the, the elders of the churches and he speaks about certain groups of individuals. Here he's going, no, I'm addressing this individual and I'm addressing this particular situation. It is a very personal letter and yet still finds itself in the scriptures because God wanted it there. Now, I mentioned that Onesimus was a runaway slave, okay? Let's talk a little bit about slavery here because I know some, some would use this to go, you see, I told you, God is for slavery, Christians are for slavery, you know? It's, it's a reason why many actually don't believe in the scriptures because they'll just go, it, it doesn't make sense. Like, it seems like God is for slavery. Let me, let me go ahead and say this. He, he is not. God is against slavery. In fact, we read this in Exodus chapter 21, verse 16, where, where it says this, kidnappers must be put to death. If the church was being obedient to that, man, there'd be a way more, way more bodies in the ground for all the things that we have seen. Kidnappers must be put to death, whether they are caught in possession of their victims or have already sold them as slaves. Like, it covers everything. It's like, oh, no, no, I don't have them anymore. No. Guilty. God is, ag he is against, let me, let me give uh, some more language to this. God is against modern day slavery. Like you cannot believe. A and so then it begs the question, then how, if we are going to talk about slavery and Onesimus being a slave, then how do we navigate through this? Let me quote Dr. Bat again. The complexity of slavery in the Greco-Roman world. It's massively complex. You see, the Greco-Roman slavery was, was widespread and, and multifaceted and complex. He says, to understand slavery in Philemon, it is imperative that the tension between widespread slavery and the uniqueness of domestic slavery be appreciated. It's a little bit of what we read in Ephesians 6 as Paul talks about this relationship between master and slave. We, we've got to hold that while recognizing that now it's very different to kind of what we understand as modern day slavery. Dr. Bat says, furthermore, slavery was not a, a function of racial prejudice back then but one of war, of pirate kidnappings, of birth, of giving of oneself into the institution. So folks would voluntarily give themselves over to this practice that they called slavery, or it was a way of debt repayment. It is therefore acknowledged that for the most part, a modern understanding of slavery, mainly from the transatlantic slave trade of the 17th to the 19th century, should be viewed at times differently from the classical slavery of the ancient world. See, to not do this, to not take historical and cultural and practical differences into account leads to, to a measure of outdated and misunderstood interpretations when dealing with texts like this. It is therefore imperative I can almost hear Beth's voice. It is, it is therefore imperative that a clear distinction be made between the 17th to the 19th century slave trade and the slavery in the Greco-Roman society. We must do this to ensure a sincere understanding of the text. I would go back and forth with Dr. Bat on this because I too wrestled. And here's what he would say, he would say, listen, I'm not trying to make excuses for, for the church's involvement in, in slavery that God is against. We should never do that. We should own up for the wrongs that we have done or have been a part of by simply, simply being the church. And at the same time, we should go, but hold on, there's also a difference here. They may use the same word, but there's a difference here. 
There's a lot of reasons to why this would happen. And look, I'm going to cover a lot of this in week three, okay? So uh, if it's still that doesn't scratch your itch, just keep coming back. We're going we're to talk at length week three on, on what this is and, and the implications of that. And so the thing you should know now is that Onesimus was a slave under the authority of Philemon and that he ran away, okay? That's what happened. That's the introduction to this whole book. Now, the reasons behind Onesimus' escape from his master are still buried in mystery. Some believe it was due to Philemon's unforgiving nature. However, that seems to be highly unlikely based on the insights of the scriptures that we read here. What we read about Philemon's character, it's highly unlikely that he was a very difficult master. It would be much more likely to consider that Onesimus was, was either very mischievous, very ungrateful, and had an appetite for dishonesty. And so when the opportunity seemed right, he ran off with a significant portion of his master's wealth, leaving Philemon deeply hurt and in dire financial circumstances. While the details of, of Onesimus' escape remain a mystery, like I've said, whether he slipped away in the darkness of the night or disguised himself as a traveler during the day, his destination was unmistakable. He was headed to Rome. Maybe he, he escaped to Ephesus collecting some elegant clothes that would mark him as a successful businessman. Then after misleading everyone, he then boards a ship headed for Rome. There he blends in the shadowy underbelly of false identities and, and, and chaos and all sorts of wickedness. And, and maybe, just like the prodigal son, after squandering everything, he finds himself out of money and out of luck. And because he had committed two capital offenses, stealing and fleeing, Onesimus was in deep trouble. See, there, there were significant crimes that he had committed because they had defied the established social order. Let me give you a clue here. Hashtag social transformation, okay? See, if caught, the Roman Empire would not allow this kind of defiance to go unpunished because if this became the norm, it would bring about the end of slavery as well as the entire Roman Empire. You see, the, the Roman Empire was founded on the institution of slavery. And so defiant slaves, if not eliminated, were at the very least marked on the forehead with a F for fugitive or a CF, cave furem, which means beware of thief. Onesimus would have been marked with both if he was not executed. These were some serious crimes. Another mystery is that we don't know how he and Paul met. We don't know. Maybe he was at his lowest, caught wind of Paul's name being mentioned and then kind of recalled uh, Paul's interactions with his master Philemon. He was like, you know what, I, I don't really know what they're talking about, but I see something different with this man Paul. Maybe, maybe Paul is a man that I can approach and, and maybe he might understand my circumstances. Maybe he might have mercy upon me. No matter the circumstances, he kept coming back time after time after time to visit Paul. And over time, Onesimus heard the gospel and not only did he hear the gospel, but he experienced genuine transformation. And as it happens with all who are blown away by the grace of God, his life took a 180 degree turn from darkness to light, from orphan to child, from rebellion to obedience. Christ was now everything to Onesimus. Onesimus was a changed man from the inside out, Soon he became one of Paul's devoted disciples, eagerly doing whatever he could do to ease Paul's imprisonment, 
whether it was running errands or doing peace jobs to be able to cover for expenses or whether it was offering counsel to others when ministry got too much for Paul. Paul began to grow in his walk with Jesus. And when the time was right, the urgency of his need to return to Philemon intensified. It might be because Onesimus came across the words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 to 24 that says this. So if you are offering your gift on the altar and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Oh, how the church would look different if we were obedient to that. So maybe it's because of that. He goes, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm now deeply convicted by this. He then goes, you know what? I, I think I need to go home. But let's not assume that this was an easy spiritual journey. He's probably wrestling. Wrestling on wh when should I go? And how will it look like? And what would happen? And what will the implications be? He's, he's wrestling with all of this. And, 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 and I believe that all of us wrestle with this. We wrestle with, with the implications of, of, of the commands of God on our lives. But this is where life on life discipleship matters. This is why I say to you, you cannot do this on your own. Because if you were on your own, it doesn't take too long. That wrestle is like, and then you go, no, I'm going to leave it alone. We find reasons to not do it. But when you are on this, this journey, this life-on-life -life discipleship journey, you've got people around you going, no, I, I know it's going to be difficult. I understand, but, 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 but press in. Continue. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. I believe Paul was that for Onesimus. And so, when he could not contain it anymore, an opportunity emerged as Tychicus, one of Paul's other devoted disciples, was preparing to journey to Asia carrying the letters of Paul to the churches in Colossae and Laodicea. Onesimus, he, he caught wind of this journey and then he, he goes to Paul and he says, listen, I, I think this is the time for me to go. Paul then crafts a short but very theologically dense letter to Philemon on Onesimus' behalf. Very high priestly of Paul. See, the, the letter to Philemon bears the aroma of reconciliation. That when we open it up, I'm telling you, what, what we are confronted with is biblical reconciliation. How it comes to bear, its implications, and how it points to the gospel of Jesus Christ in a powerful way. It is a captivating embodiment of elegance and appeal. It recognizes the simplicity of the gospel for salvation and the complexity of the gospel for sanctification. And as Christians, as Christians, we must, we must believe that the gospel can do both. Salvation and sanctification. It has the power to do both. And so in pursuit for reconciliation to occur, we should take notice of what Paul does in this letter. He doesn't use his authority as an apostle to direct things. Even though he was well in his rights to do so, he doesn't. He, do, he doesn't do that. Rather, like a masterful surgeon with a scalpel, he cuts just deep enough to expose the issue, then ensures that the correct procedure is done to bring about healing and ultimately flourishing. That's what we're going to see. And so let's, let's take a look at Paul's approach. What he does first, we see in verses 1 to 3, he warmly acknowledges Philemon and his family by name. He honors them. Referring to Philemon as a dear friend and co-worker, and then to his wife as sister, and then to their son as fellow soldier. He's going, no, 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 we, we family. We family. Then he genuinely praises Philemon in verses 4 to 7. He says this, I always thank my God when I mention you in my prayers. 
because I hear of your love for all the saints and the faith that you have in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your participation in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. I'm telling you, he's just, he's just pouring out. He's dishing it out. Encouragement after encouragement after encouragement. He's like, man, I'm so, I'm so thankful for you. And then following that in verses eight and nine, Paul emphasized that his approach was not, I am the leader, you listen. That's not, that's not the approach that he takes. And he wants to be clear about that. He doesn't want there to be any confusion for, for Philemon to go, you know, I, I may have to do what Paul's saying because he's an apostle. He's going, no, no, I don't want any of that. Here, he prefers to reach out to Philemon and the words he uses here, he says, on the basis of love. On the basis of love of love, and we all know that love cannot be forced. Also, he, 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 I love this, he communicates that he's advanced in age. I love that one. Makes me think of my mother, who often will ask me to do things and remind me of how I'm, a, I'm an elderly, mature woman. <laughs> what he's doing is he's just, he's intensifying Philemon's sense of compassion. He's just saying, hey, can you just recognize what's going on here? I, Paul, as an elderly man, and now also a prisoner of Christ in Jesus, he tells him, look, I'm, I'm also, I'm, I want you to know I'm writing this to you while I'm in prison. It's not a strategy of manipulation, but, but of deeper reflection. Or how so many of us need to be in a, a moment of deeper reflection. Then lastly, as he reaches his point in verses 10 and 11, Remember, this is Paul writing, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. I became his father while I was in chains. It's like after 145 words of a 335 letter, only now does he mention Onesimus, the central figure. And, and, and he does so with an air of, of gracious lightness. I, I love this. You'd think, I mean, this is me. I'd go, hey, what's up? How are you doing? Good. Listen, we need to talk about this person. But he goes, no, 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 man, I just want to encourage you. I want to let you know what's going on. The messages that I'm hearing about all that you're doing, it's incredible. How's the family? Paul's approach to Philemon gives us guidance for navigating our relational hurdles. His example shows us that at the, at the heart of human reconciliation is the necessity to pause and consider the emotional landscape of others, their feelings, their perceptions of the issue at hand, and their thoughts on how they view them. Imagine, imagine if both parties were doing that. The one is thinking for the other, and the other is thinking for the other. That we should have compassion. And this compassion does not come from us. I know that. I know that this compassion does not come from us. This, this compassion flows from our Father, who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. We, we need to be mindful in selecting our words. And this is of great importance. We need the Spirit to lead. If we're going to talk about reconciliation, we need the Spirit to lead. We, we need to recognize that we need some supernatural on our natural. Constitution is good. Policies are great. Programs, yeah, no problem. Tactics and strategies, we have them all. But if we do not have the Spirit empowering us, I'm telling you it's only going to be temporary if anything happens. We need the work of the Holy Spirit. And so in Paul's effort to bring about harmony, he, he recalls to Philemon, the, the deep bond, the fellowship he shares with Onesimus. You see, th this through different significant words, carefully chosen by Paul and then beautifully placed throughout the letter. Words like son and heart and beloved brother. I mean, Paul couldn't be more clear. I've read it to you, but let me read it to you again. I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus. I became his father while I was in chains. Paul's telling us that he, he, he shares a deep connection with Onesimus, far deeper than human blood. Because anybody would know, but you're not related. And he's going, no, 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 you've misunderstood the gospel. We are deeply related. 
And this is possible because we share in the blood of Jesus. This is the power of the blood of Jesus, that it has the ability to bring people from all walks of life and then to say, family. And, and I know for many of us, like, it's, it's uncomfortable because we're, we're so deep in our blood family. And, like, I'm, I'm not against it. I love it. I love it. Especially those who have an amazing, amazing family and beautiful relationships. It's all, um, like, I love it. But hear me. It pales in comparison to your blood family. I mean, Jesus, Jesus talks about this in Matthew 12. He says, while he was still speaking with the crowds, his mother and brothers were standing outside wanting to speak to him. Blood. Someone told him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to the one who was speaking to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Eh, eh. <laughs> Imagine that. Sunday lunch will not go well. Stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Blood bought. Paul is just going, I'm just doing what Jesus said. So he appeals on that. But then also, I love this, Paul even uses some unexpected humor by making a pun on Onesimus' name, which means useful, right? So Onesimus' name means useful. He says this in verse 11. Once he was useless to you, but now he is useful both to you and me. I believe that as Paul said this part, he smiled to himself and he goes, good one. But this is one of those moments where we can say many a truth is spoken in jest. That that while it's a joke, it is making a very truthful claim. You see, in Christ, hear me, if you have surrendered your life to Jesus, if you are a Christian, you need to know this, that in Christ you are useful. In Christ you are worthy. In Christ you are valuable. His workmanship created for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. You are useful. Verse 12, Paul writes, I'm sending him back to you. And then he says, I'm sending my very own heart. The Greek word for heart is is cardia, which is where we get the word cardiac. But, But here, Paul uses a slightly different word, a distinct concept that encompasses way more than just the physical. He's going, no, 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 no. There, there is a deeper connection that I have here. It is emotional. It is mental. It is spiritual. It is, it, is, it is me. Paul is saying that Onesimus matters to me. And in a way, he's saying this. He's saying, if, if you see him, you see me. Oh, I hope that that's, that's just lighting up something. I remember Jesus once going, hey, if you... If, if you see me, you see the Father. That there is a bond here. There is a powerful bond that is happening here. Then in verse 16, Paul says, regarding Onesimus, he says, he says, receive him, watch this, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave. As a dearly loved brother, he is especially so to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? In the flesh and in the Lord. In the flesh and in the Lord. Hear me, friends. I think sometimes we go, you know what? I'm okay to be your brother in Christ. But can I be your brother in law? I'll let that one sit for a moment. It'll catch up to us in week two. Paul then moves from a bold request to an even bolder expectation for Philemon. That he will act accordingly. Read verse 21. It says, since I am confident of your obedience, I'm writing you knowing that you will do even more than I say. At this point, Philemon is probably just going, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Even more. Like, I'll forgive. No problem. I'll bring him in. I'll do the whole brother in Christ. No problem. Even more. What could be even more? You see, Paul here is filled with hope. He's, He's not oblivious to the complexity of the situation, but he is aware of the power of the gospel. 
It's not like he's going, I don't understand how difficult this is going to be. No, 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 he gets all of that. But he goes, you know what? But I also know the power of the gospel. I'll say it again. Oh, how the church would look different if we believed that. Paul is filled with anticipation, eagerly awaiting the exciting possibilities that lay ahead. And so let me pause here for a moment and ask this question. What is the relational hurdle that you are currently facing now that seems like a mountain that is way too high to climb? What, what is that right now? That personal relationship that you just like, there's no ways. Let me add to that question. What is, what is the corporate? What is the corporate things, the corporate relationships, the communal things that are happening around us in our, in our church and, and, and in our city and, and in our nation that you're just like, you know what? There's no ways we'll get over that. And then ask yourself the question, how much do you believe in the power of the gospel? Last thing I want to bring to your attention before we wrap up is this, and I'm here to call the band, that way I know I'm gonna finish. It's what Paul says to Philemon in verses 17 and 19. He says, so if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would me. And if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. It's, it's, it's like he does this. He, he's, he's got a scribe, right? He's got someone writing for him, maybe Timothy, writing it for him. He's, he's saying, and then he goes, you know what? At this point, bring, bring, bring the paper, bring the pen. I want Philemon to see that this I wrote with my own hand. Write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention to you that you owe me even your very self. Paul here goes, you know what? I'm going to open a tab. I'm going to give my credit card to the individual behind the counter. And then I'm going to tell him, you see all those people? They're on my tab. Whatever they want, I'm paying for it. I mean, like, it, when you start asking for, like, you know, juice and, and, and Coke Zero and no problem. But when you start looking at the top shelf and people are requesting and they're going, no, put it on, put it on his tab. I mean, like the man behind the counter at some point goes, like he's, he's looking and going, Paul, um, Paul? And, and, and Paul comfortably goes, yeah. You see, under Roman law, he was accountable to Philemon for the loss of work owed. So everything that Philemon had lost because of Onesimus running away Roman law goes, okay, Paul, you're just saying that now you will pay Philemon for it. And, and it's not that he believed Philemon would pursue it. I mean, we see it, the, the depth of their relationship, but still he says it. You see, Paul essentially did for Onesimus what Jesus did for us in taking our sin to his own account. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says this, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. It's what many call the great exchange. It's we look at our financial books and, and we owe so much that we cannot pay. We are beyond bankrupt. I don't know what's beyond bankrupt, but that's what we are. And, and then Jesus comes with all his wealth. Ephesians tells us about the, 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 the richness of his mercy. And he comes and he says, look, look at my account. And, and there is so much here. And he goes, you know what? Let's exchange. This is the gospel. That God loves you. That he sent his son to come and die for you. That on our own, there's nothing that we can do to, to pay back God what we owe Him. We owe Him our very lives. And still, that doesn't satisfy. And so He sends His one and only Son 
to be the payment that satisfies. And for everyone who believes that that counted for them, the Bible tells us that you are saved. That you move from darkness to light, from being an orphan to being a child. When Paul writes this, he's pointing to something far greater than what we see on paper. We have so much to unpack on this, and we will. But let me close by asking the question, does the story end here? I believe unlikely. I mean, there's, there's so much here. I wish I was a fly on the wall, but, but I, can, I can only imagine what happened when Onesimus returned to Philemon. I, I can only imagine that, that, that Sunday gathering where they all got together. And, and Philemon going, no, I, I remember what Paul said to me. And so he goes and gets Onesimus, who is probably sitting in the back going, you know, I just, just being in the room, I'm so thankful. And he, he grabs him and he brings him up front and he seats him in the front and he says, we are brothers. Sad by sad. Can, can, can you imagine the room? A mixed bag of emotions. Some going, praise Jesus for his redeeming work. Others going, but Philemon, do you not remember what he did to you? I mean, we, Philemon, we were with you. We walked you through the trauma. How could you take this person back? Why would you not report this person to the authorities? C can you imagine the, 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 the other slaves going, going like, man, we... We have it good. But Onesimus, brother, when you left, things got a little... Ugh. I mean, Philemon is a good man, but, but he got hurt. And now, all of a sudden, instead of this, we had this. In, instead of that, we had this. It's, th things got a little tense. And so maybe they're looking to him going, well, we're not really happy that you're back. The parable of the prodigal son, which I love to call the parable of the prodigal father, the loving father, the amazing father, is you have the son returning, but you have the older one who doesn't join the party. He, he's, he's so fixated on, on the offense that he doesn't recognize the grace that covers the offense. A mixed bag of thought and emotion in that room. I mean, can you imagine that at the end of the gathering, instead of Philemon coming up to do the benediction, it's Onesimus standing there. I mean, Paul said he's useful. Put the man to work. And, and the congregation now having to personally reflect with their understanding of the gospel, the power of the gospel, and what the implications are on their personal lives. Can you imagine them going home and having to sit with their own slaves who have crossed the line of faith and going, but well, hold on, if Philemon is doing this, then what is our response? No matter what way you look at it, that would have been a powerful witness and declaration of the gospel. Friends, I believe Onesimus and Philemon continue to flourish in their faith and service, making significant contributions to the community. I mean, it's, it's wildly thought that Philemon, honoring Paul's heartfelt wish to have Onesimus return one day, we see this in verses 13, 14, and 20, that Philemon probably did that. It's like he had him for a season and he went, yeah, I want to honor Paul and, and, and so let me send you back. And so he sends him back to Rome. Where many, many believe that Onesimus continued to grow into a faithful and gifted servant of the Lord. In fact, there, there is historical evidence that points and points strongly in that direction. See, Ignatius of Antioch, writing sometime around 110 AD, refers to a bishop in Ephesus 
by the name of, what you think? What you think? You're gonna get it right, I trust you guys. Onesimus. Is this the same Onesimus? There is certainly possibility. See, if, if Onesimus was a fairly young man when Paul wrote to Philemon, a young lad, as we would say, it is possible that this could be the same man some 50 years later. And so Ignatius writes this. There's evidence of this. He writes this. He says, I received, therefore, your whole multitude in the name of God through Onesimus, a man of inexpressible love. In expressible love. It is a love that you cannot contain. How does a man, how does a person have inexpressible love? It's because they've received inexpressible love. As people like to say, game recognize game. Inexpressible love. He's, his whole life, Onesimus is just going, I, I cannot believe that I get to live the life that I live. This is who I was. This is what I did. But because I had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, this is now who I am and this is what I get to do. Do do we live like that? Or has this become so normal that there is no difference between the church and those who do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior? I continue to read. A man of inexpressible love and your bishop in the flesh whom I pray you by Jesus Christ to love and that you would seek to be like him and blessed be he who has granted unto you being worthy to obtain such an excellent bishop. Societal transformation. That once a slave, now an excellent And so imagine, I leave you with this. Imagine if we believed the gospel. If we believe what we read, redemption, reconciliation, fellowship, societal transformation. If we, if we believed this, imagine. that Some of us are so hell-bent on being right. And I use that word intentionally, hell-bent that that we're right on our doctrine and right on our theology and right on our procedures and processes and right on me and this is what I did. We're so, like, I'm not against, like, guys, hear me. I love the gospel first and foremost. Life, death, resurrection, ascension, and one day return of our Lord and Savior. But we need to be careful that we do not elevate our personal preferences that we're so hell-bent that we we will not, we will not even consider reconciliation. We diminish the power of the gospel in our lives. But imagine, imagine if we got out of the way and we said, Jesus, be the center. Be the center of this complexity in which we live. And as the church begins to be the church then would we be a city on a hill that folks would be forced to look upon and go there is something radically different happening there what is it and our only answer would be Jesus 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 and so these next three weeks are going to be quite a journey for us as we unpack more and as we look at the practicality of all of this, my prayer is that we would lean in into the power of the gospel. And so, Father, that is my prayer. Would you do a massive work in and through us that this very short letter has so much in it. It speaks of the power of your finished work, Jesus and the implications of that in our lives. And so Holy Spirit, we need you. This is hard. Many of us, we think about the dynamics of our our family, whether it's with parents or siblings, 
extended family. We think about the dynamics of work, our neighborhood. We think of the dynamics of this very church. We think of the dynamics of this nation, the history that it has and and all that, that, that comes into play. Father, we think about all those things. And we can too often find ourselves staring up at this mountain and going, there is no ways to climb this thing. It is just so much easier to continue with our own lives. Oh, but God, would you give us supernatural power to climb this mountain stone by stone. Because we know what awaits us at the top. And so God, would you right now be working in the hearts of those that we probably are going to have to have a conversation with. It's complex. But you will give us everything that we need. And that all of that flows from the realization that we have been reconciled to you. That the dividing wall of hostility is no more. Save us. Help us. Heal us, restore us, reconcile us. It's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen.